Well, bless the Lord, O my soul, and together let us bless his holy name. Hi, I'm Bishop Hugh and Hannah, and welcome to The Word with Bishop Hannah. I am so humbled. I am so happy. I am overjoyed just to be able to sit before you and to talk about the goodness of God. Isn't God a wonderful God? And you may say, but Bishop Hannah, I have problems on every hand. But you know what? You have life. The fact that you have life means that God has given you another opportunity to see his goodness and also to be someone who will testify as to the goodness of God. Everything is not honey, sugar, and spice for us all, but the faithfulness of our God is such that he's promised to be that friend who is even closer than our very brother. Well, today I want to speak on this topic, my passion, my possessions, my passion, my possessions. In this sermon today, I wish to define passion and possessions without referring to the dictionary. In other words, I wish to use a working definition. And so, to the academically astute among us, I beg your indulgence. To me, passion is to have zeal or a persistent inner drive to go after something. To me, Possession is to have ownership of something or to have it under one's control. Again, I remind us that these are my own definitions. As a young person graduating high school and landing a job, my passion, like that of my peers, was to either own a motor vehicle or a piece of the rock. Back then, it was referred to as buying a piece of property. When you accomplished either one or a combination of these two, you were considered to be well on your way. It was not too long that I acquired both of these with sacrifice and discipline. But then the quest for more became evident. And so in time, I pursued and received a first degree. This was followed by a second, combined with an extensive exposure to professional training, both locally and internationally. I got married, and uh, my wife and I began a family. Things just kept on getting better and better. My passion grew exponentially. My possession kept pace with the excitement of seeing God come through for me in some of the most remarkable ways. This was all good within the framework of the prevailing culture back in the day. Years later though, how many young persons are motivated by the same quest to go after their own heart's desire? To be certain, there is nothing wrong with wanting to do better for one's self or even having the capacity to imagine big things. Perhaps if more of our young people would elevate their level of thinking and being, there would be less persons walking around with low or diminished self-esteem. Notwithstanding, passion and possessions can only take you so far. This is the, this is the crux of this message today. Passion and possessions can only take you so far. There is more to being who God wants us to be than our ability to go after things as noble as they may appear. I draw your attention to Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2 in the New Living Translation, or NLT. And here's what the writer says. I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from Him. Can I say that again? I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes before him. This has nothing to do with how we work, how we apply ourselves. Fundamentally, what the writer is saying is that in the midst of everything that I experience, all of my abilities, all of my credentials, as it were, none of these things take me out of the realm of waiting patiently on God for my victory, which comes from him. It 
continues in verse 2, He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will never be shaken. And there are things in life that will shake you to your core. There are experiences that can diametrically go against what you have fundamentally been comfortable with for all of your life. And there comes a time when your foundation seems as if it's going to come out of the ground and that you are going to be completely destabilized and annihilated. But the psalmist here is saying, God alone is my rock and my salvation. He's a place where I can put my anchor, but also in God I find salvation. In other words, I'm saved from the vicissitudes and the challenges of life as we know it. My fortress then will never be shaken. And what he's talking about is your fortress will never be shaken to the point where you, you lose grip or God loses his grip on you. This is amazing because some things happen to us that are very, very horrific. Some things happen to us that are almost earth shaking, earth moving. But despite that, God can remain the force of stability in our lives. So the quest then to be in control of one's affairs is always pulling us away from ultimately trusting God with the details of our lives. God, life is busy. And if you are an ambitious person, life is always showing to you opportunities where you can go out and do more and be more. But the writer causes us to believe that if we exhaust ourselves running after ourselves and running after the things that we deem necessary to ourselves, our lives can be spent, we can amass a whole, amass a whole lot of success. And really, when you measure them against what is really substantively what God wants us to be, we can find ourselves still not having accomplished anything or little to anything, little to nothing. We use our intellectual prowess to determine what we will have. We go after, we go after what we want with gusto and excitement. And for many, we succeed with little or no output because that's the way God has created some of us and many of us have been able to apply ourselves through study, discipline, and other areas of exposure to the extent that we can zero in, almost laser focus on what it is we want. But then the temptation to do more, be more, and accomplish more takes a hold of us. And before you know it, we are building our lives while designing God out. Hear me again. We are building our lives while designing God out. By designing God out, I refer to the notion to simply bypass God and create an illusion that we did it all on our own. Be warned. Be forewarned, my brother, my sister. Whatever you do and whatever you accomplish in this life, if God is not a part of it, you have not fully accomplished anything. Or what you think you've accomplished, you will be sure changed at some point. Nothing, nothing can be further from the truth when we decide that the best way to go forward is to leave God in the back. You cannot. You'll be frustrating yourself. You'll be frustrating others. Because if you're going to go forward with God, you have his presence, you have his attention, you have God looking at the very details of your life. It was God back then, it is God now, and it will always be God. Regardless of how much we may try to dismiss God out of the human economy, out of the human equation, God superimposes himself upon our lives, upon our very existence. You and I can never ever get away from God. He will come after us, not to harass us, but he will let us know through conviction, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, that we need him and that he has the best cause for our lives. So think about the intangibles of life. He, God has given us an excellent brain that we use almost flawlessly, or many persons use flawlessly. He has given you the presence of mind 
to formulate strategies and execute them with admiration. Here again is the psalmist, Psalm 62, 1 and 2. I'm just reminding us what the writer says. I was quiet before God, for my victory comes from him. We wait patiently in submission and in obedience to God, and uh, God will give us that victory when and where it is required. It's like what Jesus said in the New Testament when he says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This is instructive. Waiting, my beloved, requires patience, alertness, and a sense of expectation. The writer says that he does all of this in anticipation that God will give him victory. I want to say to you today, if you're moving quickly, if you're moving at, at meteoric speed, I want to say slow down. Make sure that God is in the very details of your life. Because if you go anywhere and you exclude God, you will not have full and complete success. I know sometimes we feel as if we have deadlines to meet. We feel as if we have goals to accomplish. And many persons feel as if because life moves so fast and every day is so fleeting, we feel as if we have to make this decision now and that we have to do things right now. My beloved, it is better for you to exercise the virtue of patience and allow God to guide you and to lead you into the future than to make a mess of everything based on your current circumstances. And so the writer says, again, that he does all of this in anticipation that God will give him victory. This is remarkable. In other words, he does not run ahead of God. He does not fall prey to his passion or his possessions. You see, everyone wants to be rich. Everyone wants to be able to live at a level where they don't have to beg. They do not have to compromise their own dignity and the self-worth. Unfortunately, it's not always just like a flick of a, of a switch. We have to work. We have to apply ourselves. But my contention and the contention of this message today is that be careful when you become so enthused about what you need to be doing that you do not leave God out. Do not fall prey to your passion and your possession. He, God, simply wants us to wait on him. Wait before him. And this word wait doesn't mean idly waiting. It means engaging ourselves in the things that the Holy Spirit will cause us to be engaged in. I can think of prayer. I can think of helping others. I can think of involving ourselves in ministry. I can think of doing things in community, doing things in family, but certainly doing things that will cause us to understand that as we are doing what God has called us to do or what God is directing us to do, that God is also doing something for you and me. We do not have to rush God. We do not have to feel rushed. All we need to do is submit ourselves to God and allow God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to come through for us. This world seems to be moving very quickly. Every day something else is coming up, whether it's good, whether it is cataclysmic, something is always coming up. But when we decide we're going to discipline ourselves and we're going to be settled in our mind that God is with us, then our passion, this thing that pushes us, this thing that says we have to get it now, that will be subdued, that will be brought under godly control by the power and the spirit of Almighty God. And our possessions God will give to us. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things. What are these things that the scripture was talking about, that Jesus was talking about? A place to live. Food to eat, clothes to wear. According to Maslow's theory, these are the basic and fundamental needs of all of us human beings. Well, wouldn't you like to be able to have these things, but also at the same time have peace of mind? To be able to have not just a semblance of sanity, 
but to be able to go about your day and work and be objectively involved in the course of your own life. It can happen when we allow God to take control of our passion and to supply the possessions that you and I will need as we traverse this world. And so he, he is looking, God is looking for us to submit ourselves to him. And the man who is wise, he will be looking to God for a move from God before he moves ahead in his life. Think about it. I'm going to stay right here, Lord, giving you praise, glory, and honor. I'm going to be what is I'm going to do what is expected of me. And when you tell me to move, and the direction that you tell you tell me to move in, I am going to move with the exuberance of a person who is depending on God for my very, very daily uh, sustenance and sustenance. This is a good God. He is looking. This man is looking to the one true source of success. And this is Almighty God. As if trying to convince us of the permanency of God, here's what the psalmist says. He doubles down and he says, He alone, I'm re-emphasizing this, He alone is my rock and my salvation. And He is my fortress where I will never be shaken. God wants us, you and me, to be purposeful and intentional in this life. We cannot afford to waste the gifts that he has so richly blessed us with on the altar of personal pursuits. Discover what God has placed in you. Discover how you can use those things to bring praise and honor and glory to God. Discover or rediscover how the gifts and the talents that he so richly blessed you with, how you can use those to impact positively upon the lives of other persons in your community, in your church, wherever you are and wherever you hope to be. This message is one that is going to hopefully get us started, get that engine started, and know that you can be an accomplished individual by trusting God with the details of your life. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Instead, in addition to what we've been saying, we are to seek the Spirit's leading and follow Him into a rich life that will bring glory and honor to God. I see people sometimes, the pomp and circumstance with which they and their affiliates put on them. And sometimes I wonder if people believe that they are God, little gods. Beloved, hear me again. We are to seek the leading of the Holy Spirit and let allow our lives to bring honor and the glory to God. How do you know when you're bringing honor and glory to God? When His presence speaks to you and gives you that ease in your spirit that God is pleased with what you're doing. How do you know when you're bringing glory to God, when your life and the things that you do align themselves with the word of God? How do you know when you're bringing glory to God, when others are being drawn to him? Jesus said to the disciples, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Again, I tell us, the word says, but grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when these things happen to us, when we are healthy Christians, spiritually speaking, glory comes to God. Work for him. Get excited about doing what he's called you to do. In verses 5 and 7 of this same psalm, we see the personal outpouring of the psalmist as he speaks about his relationship and the relationship he has with God. Verse 5 of the psalm says, Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for he is my hope. What he's talking about is this level of discipline that says, I'm going to bring everything about me, all of the busyness of my life, I'm going to bring it into one area, and I'm going to submit all of that to the will the power, the command, and the control of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, for my hope is in him. 
Do you know how many people have misplaced hope, misplaced trust in people, in things, in institutions, even in themselves? The psalmist is encouraging us by implication that we ought to so have our lives ordered by God that our hope is in him. Does that mean that we should not look to the future? That we should not plan for the future? Oh yes, it, does not, it doesn't mean that. What it means is that whatever we do with the future in mind, we should always be grounded in the fact that at the very core, the epicenter of what we do and who we are, that it is grounded in God and the presence of God. I look at people in awe. I look at people in almost in frightening ways when I think about the fact that they're doing so many things in the absence of the will and the presence of God, the divine approval of God. They just, they just run amok doing what they want to do. I am going to trust in God. I am going to allow my passion to be ordered, to be tempered by the Holy Spirit. I am going to allow that to happen in my life because I've discovered that when I take things into my own hands, I do not have the capacity. I certainly do not, do not have the tenacity to do and to deal with the things, all the things that my life is connected to. And perhaps you are the same way. Verse 6 says, He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress will not be shaken. Verse 7 says, My victory and honor come from God alone. This is putting everything into its proper perspective. When someone uh, give you, uh, uh, applaud you for work that you do, when someone tells you that you're doing an incredible work, be careful, be careful, my brother, my sister, be careful to ascribe the praise and the honor and the glory to God. You do not have a halo that people can buff and make you look like you are so this or so that. Give God the praise and the glory. And I've discovered that when we praise God, he lifts us up. When we give God what he is deserving of and what he requires of us, when we do that, I've discovered that God is pleased. And when God is pleased, he, look, he looks in our direction and we are blessed as a result of it. Verse 7 continues, he is my refuge. It's a place where I can go. I can be refreshed. I can be protected from the evils of life, from the temptations of the enemy. It's a place where I can go and I can be vulnerable with God. Bless you, Jesus. There are some people, when you're around them, you cannot be vulnerable. They're looking for that misstep. They're looking for that mistake. They're looking for that part of your humanity that they can take advantage of and then they can put you on blast and let everyone know that you're not the Christian that you ought to be and or that you say that you are. But in this context, the psalmist is saying, he is my refuge. God already knows our weaknesses. He already knows our shortcomings and our inconsistencies. We are fallible creatures. But we can be vulnerable with God. Because God does not take our vulnerability and use it against us. What he does is he gives us an opportunity to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, someone is receiving this word today. He is my refuge. And listen to this. A rock where no enemy can reach me. In my mind, I get this picture that God encircles us. That God protects us to the extent that even when the enemy is at a great distance away, the Holy Spirit alerts us. And not only does he alert us, he deals with the enemy before the enemy deals with us. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? I don't have to run after my enemy. I don't have to slavishly think about what my enemy is doing. But I can trust in God. A songwriter says, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. I may have some smarts about me. You may even have more smarts than I have. But the sum total of it is we need to be trusting God. We need to be depending on God and allow the Holy Spirit to come through for us. Oh, my beloved, God does not call us 
to sinless perfection. He calls us to complete submission to him. And then he makes us what he will have us to be. Stop trying to be perfect. Stop trying to be exacting on yourself and others. Simply submit to him. Trust him. And watch God take you where you ought to be. We cannot produce righteousness. We certainly cannot produce holiness. But when we submit to the righteous one and to the holy one, he does the heavy lifting for you and me. Oh God, touch us. Oh God, make us what you will have us to be. Perhaps you, my friend, my viewing friend, you are at a crossroad in your life where you have some things and so many things on your to-do list. Some people call it a bucket list. You are eager to explore and to conquer the world. Well, just before you take off, remember that you do not have to attempt this on your own. Passion can create possession, and possessions can bring a feeling of accomplishment. But when you have done all that you set out to do, what do you do? with this feeling that there is still something that you have yet to successfully face. What do you do with that little blind spot in your life? Yes, I've done a lot. I got my property, I got my vehicle, I got my family, I got my college degree, I got all of this. I have, I have reach, I have uh, respectability, but I feel this gnawing emptiness on the inside of me. What do you do? What do you do? Well, here's what the psalmist says to people in general in verses 8 to 12 of the passage that we're making reference to. He says, Oh, my people, this is you, this is me, this is us, this is the person who works right across from your cubicle, this is your boss, this is your family. Oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. I'm going to say it again. You can be vulnerable with God. You can show him your weaknesses, your, your blind spots, your indiscretions. He already knows it. But you can be revealing also. Verse 9 says, Common people are as worthless as a puff of wind, and the powerful are not what they appear to be. If you weigh them on the scales together, they are lighter than a breath of air. This is the National the New Living Translation, the NLT. You heard what God is saying? The people we call the commoners. Here's the passage the psalmist is saying, common people are as worthless as a puff of wind. He's not saying that the humanity of the person. What he's saying is that all this stuff that we fuss over, we are still only what God has made us to be. Flesh and blood. But the Spirit of God influencing our lives, hopefully. The powerful are not what they appear to be. You know, there are some people when they walk into a room, the aura of their presence will cause some people to be transfixed. If we can only have that reverential fear for God that we give to people because of their office, because of their wealth, because of their ability, all to take God at his word, all to recognize that your boss cannot do nothing for you that God cannot do more of. That your money can never go to places where God can reach and impact the quality of your life. Oh, my friend, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Verse 10 says, don't make your living by extortion or put your hope in stealing. You cut corners. You don't have to cheat. You don't have to be an extortionist. Here's this word. And if your wealth increase or increases, don't make it the center of your life. Thank God that God can take you from the doldrums of commonality and God can put you on the top of wherever that is. But recognize that it is God. Verse 11 says, God has spoken plainly and I've heard it in many times. I've heard it many times. Power, O oh God, belongs to you. Unfailing love, O oh Lord, is yours. As a pastor, I not only go to funerals regularly, but I conduct, I officiate at a lot of homegoing service. And I see spouses weeping. My heart goes out to them. I do not know what they're going through because God has blessed me that I am married 42 years 
and my spouse is very much alive and well. But the pain that these people go through, knowing that the person you've poured yourself into and vice versa is no longer with you. But here's what this word says. Oh God, power belongs to you. Unfailing love, oh God, is yours. You wake up tomorrow, God will still be loving you. You wake up a thousand years from now, if that were possible, God will still be loving you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. Do not replace God by your passion. Do not replace God by your possessions. Keep God at the center mast of your life. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Verse 12 says, before we pray, surely you repay all people according to what they have done. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Stop sweating the hard stuff, the small stuff. Stop exerting yourself and allow God to step in and to change the dynamics of your life. Oh, how he wants to come in. Oh, how he wants to make a difference. Oh, he wa how he wants to tell you, take your hands off the control. Let him step in and let him regulate your affairs. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, Lord, we thank you for this open door. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we will not be governed by our passions. We will not be deceived by our possessions. But, God, that we will give everything to you. And we will allow you, Lord, to regulate our lives to the extent, Lord, that we will wait on you. Because in you is our victory. In you is our permanency. In you, O oh God, hallelujah, is our future, our eternal hope. And so I pray for my brother, my sister, who may be watching and engaging this word right now. Lord, touch them in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for that family that is besieged by problems. I pray for that community that may be slipping into a state of lawlessness and godlessness. Lord, I pray that you would turn the circumstances around and that you would give them the joy of the Lord, which indeed is their strength. Thank you now, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, my brother, my sister. I love you dearly. I'm Mr. Puel and Ahana. And we had a wonderful time today with the word. I'm looking forward to being in this same spot with you another time by the grace of God. Until then, do not allow your passion to rule your possessions. Look to God and allow him to order your steps. God bless you.